we're back. We're at Book Expo America. This is Book View Now on PBS.org. And we're very happy right now to have Anthony Mara with us for his book, The Czar of Love and Techno. First of all, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, a Constellation of Vital Phenomena, your first novel was a huge uh, hit. A lot of people talked all about it. You created quite a buzz. Now you're here to talk about this new book. Have you been to Book Expo America before? I was here briefly last year, but this is, is the first time that I've been to, uh, to sort of support a, a forthcoming book. Yeah, where, where they already may know your name now. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier when we, before we were around that it was quite, quite a lot of energy in the room. What's it like for you as an author to be amongst so many people in the energy of a place like Book Expo? I, it's, it's just an honor, really. I, I think that for me, and it's probably the case with most writers, we do our work sort of in solitude in, in our kitchens, in a, you know, wearing our pajamas. Um, and to come out into, into the world and, and to, to meet the people who are actually the reason that we write, the people who, who, uh, who read our, our, our books, and you know, to be able to look them in the eye and shake their hand and, and say thank you is, um, is just a tremendous honor. So, um, so a, a, an event like this where you can get so many um, book lovers, sort of the entire spectrum of, of how a book is, is created to, to, to how it's produced, to how it's read, is, uh, is a really exciting event. Yeah, it is. I love the whole uh, amazing combination of booksellers, librarians, book mm -hmm. lovers, all in one place. It really is a lot of fun for anybody who loves books. Mm -hmm. And people who love books love your books, um, especially this new one, which is really generating, a, like the first, a lot of buzz. Can you tell us about uh, where it all starts? 1930s Russia is where you jump right in. Uh, it's another era that you're exploring. Tell us about how you found your way to that, that period of history. Yeah, a lot of it came out of, of research that I did for Constellation. Um, when you're researching a book, I think there's, there's a tendency to want to shoehorn um, all of the interesting things that you find into it. And, and I tried to resist that with Constellation. And, um, and there were a number of, of historical moments that I wanted to, to someday touch upon. And, and I tried to do this with, with this book. And, and it begins, as you mentioned, in the 1930s. Um, with the, the censoring of, of uh, images of Stalin's enemies. This was one of the first instances of, of sort of a widespread use of, of the airbrush, the most sort of modern tool of, of photographic manipulation. Stalin's enemies would be airbrushed out of official portraits and, and, and artworks. Um, and uh, it's, the book spans the, the 20th century and, and was sort of my way of trying to um, trying to deal with some of the same issues and themes that Constellation dealt with from, from more of a Russian uh, perspective. So what, what is it when you see something like the use of the airbrush, what is it that makes you stop and say, I, I think there might be something in there that I'd like to spend three or 400 pages writing <laughs> about? I think it's, it, it's a great question. And I think it's, it's uh, one of those moments that, that we've probably all had as, as, as readers or as consumers of, um, of, of narrative where where we see or read or hear something that just makes us um, understand a moment, understand our own lives in a slightly different way. Um, and so the idea that, that the airbrush, which you know, I, I associate with, um, with fashion magazines or, or um, that sort of thing, uh, that it actually um, had this role in, in um, political repression 75 years ago, um, uh, just made, made my, my uh, the hair on the back of my neck stand up a little bit. And um, I wanted to try to understand who would be the people who actually did, you, who used the airbrush, who, who erased, um, erased these political dissenters. Um, they were artists. Um, you know, they, they, they were, in, 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 the, in the, the book, it's, it's a portrait artist. It's somebody who is trained to, uh, to create portraits of people. He's the person who's tasked with then erasing them. Um, and I think those moments where, um, where you begin to see your own history, you begin to see um, the history of the, of the world that you live in in uh, different ways and begin to see the, the sort of strange and paradoxical links um, that, uh, that tie you know, the cover of, of a fashion magazine today with a portrait um, in Stalin's Russia 75 years ago um, is, is kind of the reason that, that um, that reading is is so engaging to me in the first place. Yeah, well, I agree with that. You, the, the juxtaposition, the juxtaposition of, of oppression and art is a big theme in this book, and it seems like something that's really interesting that you're really interested in. Um, there's also a, a ballerina, a prima ballerina that, that comes into this, uh, which I think you sort of layer in in a really beautiful way too, especially at that era 
when um, that was such a significant part of Russia's history. Tell us about when you brought that character and that element into the story too. Well, thank, thank you very much. Um, I think that that uh, as artists, um, you know, writers, we, we tend to to want to see art as being uh, this purely transformative and transcendent and beautiful thing. And, and I think that, of course, in, in many ways it is. Um, but in a, a place like the Soviet Union, it was also um, politically corrosive and, and it could uh, corrupt and coerce as much as, as it could um, redeem. And so I wanted to see the ways that, um, that artists were used um, as tools of, of uh, political manipulation and, and political uh, repression. Um, and how something like, like Swan Lake, for instance, which comes up in, in the book a couple times, was the most popular ballet in, in the Soviet Union because there was a sense that it was very well ordered and that all of the swans were sort of, um, were dancing sort of in their places a little bit. Um, and uh, Khrushchev at, at one point said that, 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 you know, if he saw another, another version of, of Swan Lake, yeah. he'd, he'd lose it. <laughs> um, and so the idea that these things that we associate with um, with sort of pure beauty, you know, the height of, of human um, creativity um, can be as corruptible as anything else that, that humans uh, have invented. Well, now you see, with the advent of Instagram and all sorts of uh, digital tools, the idea of the airbrush, which is less an art form than an actual way of life. I mean, kids today and, and adults for that matter, becoming very adept at home, just using whatever the tools are available to them to sort of cut out that old boyfriend out of their Instagram or Facebook photo <laughs> yeah. or to kind of fix something that maybe they don't like, a blemish or whatnot. So the airbrush is becoming sort of natural um, to the point where I think we've become accepting it. Um, yeah. You see a danger of sliding too far into the point where airbrushing isn't even seen as anything too sinister? I'm not sure. I think, I think that that's a great question. I think it, it's sort of we're always, you know, maybe retouching our own, um, our own stories and our own narratives. Um, and our own pasts, you know, if if uh, if you tell uh, if you tell a story today to, to a friend that, that you've told you know a hundred times before, are you really telling the, the story of, of what you remember? Or are you telling sort of uh, has the story has the story sort of overtaken the memory? Ha do we sort of fictionalize um, our experiences um, in the way that we sort of present ourselves yeah. um, to, to to the world at large? And um, and I think that sort of, uh, you know, we all want to hide our blemishes a bit. Yeah. Um, we're, we're always gonna, gonna um, sort of uh, spin the truth a little bit to make ourselves, uh, ourselves look a bit better. And I think the, the airbrush and, and all of the, um, you know, tools available on, on Photoshop and, and Instagram um, is just maybe one of the more visually obvious ways that, that we do that. Yeah, it's also the way we just present the, way, the life we want to present on something like Facebook. I'm, I'm sure that my fabulous life that I give to you on Facebook is absolutely nothing <laughs> like the, uh, the unvarnished look behind the curtain. Um, yeah. And to some degree, there's a, a real theme there about sort of the, what we present and what I think they were doing in a more obvious way by airbrushing you know, enemies out of Stalin's photographs. Mm -hmm. back then. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just the fact that, that we're able to connect something like Facebook to um, to, to, to airbrushing in, in uh, the Soviet Union, um, I feel like is, 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 an exa is sort of goes back to the earlier point you, you made about, um, about, about how, uh, or the other question you had about how, uh, you know, how, how stories get born. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I spend, like most people, far too much time on Facebook and, and uh, you know, of course the world that, or, or, or the, the, the version of myself that I present there is, is, is uh, maybe not inaccurate, but, but omits, you know, much, much of the truth. Yeah. And, um, you don't need all those details. Yet. No, yeah. no, of course, it's always just, uh, <laughs> just you know, barbecues and, uh, right. and beautiful baby photos and things. Exactly. So history is a big part of what you do. Um, were you a history kid growing up? And is it something that you think about uh, writing a historical novel um, uh, as opposed to, and obviously it's, this isn't purely historical, but thinking about bringing history into your storytelling? Yeah, it, it, it has been something I've, I've, I've thought about. Uh, a, a number of people uh, called Constellation a historical novel or historical fiction, which um, I, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with just because it's set in 2004. Um, and I began writing it in 2008. Right. Um, so, so it's very recent uh, history. Um, but, uh, but I have been thinking about it. My dad is a huge history buff, and growing up, um, 
he would. I don't think he owns a single book that's uh, that's fewer than a thousand pages, <laughs> and and they're always these sort of like these massive epic tomes, tomes on yeah. like Julius Caesar, and it's always it's always uh, dictators. Did you in, read in books the... like that when you were younger? I mean, were you also a huge reader? Or that like unintimidated by the fat book? Yeah, yeah. No, I I, I love those um, those sort of door stoppers where you can just get immersed in uh, in yeah. the world, but. Um, but yeah, my dad has always just been sort of almost an amateur historian, where um, where he can tell you, you know, interesting facts about any period and yeah. um, over the last several thousand years, and uh, the ability to to see how um, you know the world we live in now is is so connected to these earlier periods um, seems like a vital act of of, of literature and, and something that's um, you know that that's worthy of of, uh, of being explored. Well, the book is The Czar of Love and Techno. You're Anthony Mara, and it's great to have you here. I'm thrilled to see uh, you follow up with such a strong second novel. I know there's always sort of the pressure of how you'll get to that next one. It's so wonderful to see you doing so well. Thank you so much. And thanks so much for joining us here today. Thanks really for great me. to have you.